The problem we'll use for this example is estimating the effect of sodium intake on blood pressure. This is an important problem because 46% of Americans have high blood pressure, and high blood pressure is associated with increased risk of mortality. We'll take this example from epidemiology, specifically from Luque Fernandez et al., 2018, and the outcome in this example is systolic blood pressure, which is a continuous quantity. The treatment is sodium intake, which is also a continuous quantity, and it'll be measured in milligrams. We will binarize this quantity by making it 1 if it's above 3.5 milligrams and 0 if it's below 3.5 milligrams. This binarization isn't important for this example, as we'll see. Even if we keep it as continuous, we'll still get the same answer, but we do it because the adjustment formula that we'll be using that we showed you is for binary treatments, and just to keep things simple, we'll use that for now. The covariates in this example are two. The first is age, and the second is the amount of protein excreted in urine, which happens to be relevant for this problem. And this example from this paper is a simulation, so we know the true ATE is 1.05 because we have access to the code for the simulation. In fact, we have code in the book, so if you go to the associated reading for this part of the course, you'll see a link to a GitHub repo that gives you code for all of this. Now that we've specified all the details of this problem, let's actually get to estimation of the ATE. The true ATE is 1.05. First, we have to identify the average treatment effect by using the adjustment formula to turn it into a statistical estimate. So the average treatment effect is a causal estimate, we turn it into a statistical estimate. Now we actually need to go through the process of estimation, the novel part of this part of the lecture. The first thing we do is we take the outer expectation in the adjustment formula, the right-hand side of the above equation, and we replace it with an empirical mean over x. So we replace an expectation over x with an empirical mean over x. Then we model these conditional expectations. In this example, we'll use linear regression, which turns out to work well because the simulated data is actually linear. We can actually use any model that is minimizing the mean squared error, where it's the mean squared error of the prediction of y given treatment and x as inputs. When we take an empirical mean over x, so over our data, and we fit a model to our data, we can get an actual estimate. And that specific estimate we get, in this case, is 0 0.85. In contrast, the naive estimate that we would get if we were to just fit a model for y given t, so just regressing y on t, and then subtracting those two modeled conditional expectations. If we were to do that naive approach, we would get an estimate of 5.33. So recall that the true ATE is 1.05. This naive estimate is 407% off the true ATE. In contrast, our estimate is only 19% off when we adjust for x here. We used the adjustment formula on the previous slide to get an estimate of the ATE, but it turns out in this specific setting, because our data are generated via a linear function, we actually can just use the coefficient in front of t in the linear regression. So in order to do this, we first assume a linear parametric form. So that's that our outcome is generated as a linear function of t and x. Then, given this assumption, we just run linear regression. We regress y on t and x to estimate alpha and beta here. Estimates have hats on top of them. And if we were to do this, we would actually get alpha hat equals 0.85, the exact same estimate that we got in the previous slide when we used the adjustment formula. And we have code for this on the code GitHub that's linked in the corresponding part of the book. This is quite useful because if we have continuous treatments, 
we might not be interested in this specific difference in potential outcomes for when t equals 1 and t equals 0. More generally, we could be interested in just the expected value of yt. So this is a function of t. And if we were to run linear regression while keeping t continuous, so this data actually is originally continuous and then we binarized t, we would still get this same value of alpha. And you can run this for yourself and see that when you keep t continuous, you get the exact same estimate. So this approach is extremely simple. All we have to do is fit a linear regression and then take the coefficient in front of t as our estimate. So that's great. And additionally, it has the benefit of collapsing this whole function of t, expected value of yt, down into a single scalar. And this is great. It's great power, but we're only able to do this because of some important assumptions we made, which have pretty severe implications. So the first is, well, the main one is that we assumed a linear parametric form. This actually has the implication that the causal effect is the same for all individuals in the population, which can be a pretty unnatural assumption in most cases. So this is implied by the assumption of a linear parametric form. And to show you this, just consider that yit is equal to alpha t plus beta xi. That's just taking that assumed parametric form and then writing out the unit level potential outcome that that implies. Then if we take the unit level causal effect, we can write it as follows, where the minus alpha times zero term is just zero, and then the beta terms cancel, and we just get alpha. So this importantly does not depend on xi, which means that the unit level causal effect is the same no matter what x i is, it's the same for all individuals. It's always alpha. And this is implied by this linear parametric form that we assumed. So in general, it's not a good idea to use just the coefficient of linear regression. And some authors have more extended critiques of this. Morgan and Winship is the book that we link to in our course reading. And I encourage you to check this out. But I figured I'd just show this to you because it's commonly used. And in our case, where we actually have linear data, it does give us the right answer in this simple case. And here's a link to Morgan and Winship. It's just sections 6.2 and 6.3, where they give this more complete critique of using the coefficient in linear regression as the estimate of your average treatment effect. With that complete example of estimating the average treatment effect done, we will conclude the potential outcomes lecture. If you want to get notifications for when next week's lecture comes out, then go ahead and subscribe and click the bell below. Also, go ahead and leave any questions you have about the lecture in the comments below, and I'll make sure to get to them as soon as I can. Thank you for watching.